All right, sorry about that. Had a UPS delivery. Had to take care of it. Uh, not a real good time for it, but oh well. But uh, no friend like Jesus to answer your question. Um, I would say that you know we are very close to the mark of the beast system implementation. We're going to be leaving before that happens. But I can't imagine that this cashless society is going to wait for three and a half years after the body of Christ is gone. I believe that kind of the reaction to the body of Christ leaving is going to be the like George W. Bush said, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. You know, and I think that that's going to be what's going to come in. If you're uh, to prove that you're not a terrorist and whatever part of this extremist group that whatever whatever they say about us you know, Christians that have been raptured away, um, you know, sign up, you know, you know, with your allegiance there. The economy's collapsing, so uh, I can't imagine that they're going to somehow revitalize the economy for three and a half years in the time of Jacob's trouble, then implement the mark of the beast. I think it's going to be right away with the appearance of the Antichrist, which he appears after the body of Christ is gone. Again, I've done more studies on that. You can look into that. But uh, let's continue here. We have the otter Felix. What does Luke mean in Luke 19.27 about Jesus slaying his enemy? enemies? Thanks means a lot. Luke 19 verse 27. Let's go there. I haven't really prepared for any of these. I'm just kind of take them as we go. Luke 19, 27. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them bring hither and slay them before me. All right. Um, talking about... Uh, you know, these different servants and things, and um, you know, verse 16, if you jump up to there, it says, Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, uh, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And he goes down through the different servants, and there in verse 27, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. What's that talking about? Well, Keep your hand there in Luke 19 and go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be got, gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And the ones on his right hand, of course, uh, and he, verse 33, And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. The sheep go into the kingdom and the goats go into hell, basically there. Um, everlasting fire, verse 41. You can read down the rest of the verses there. But there's that separation, the separating the wheat from the chaff. So those enemies that would not have Jesus Christ rule over them, those Jews... I believe the Jews that reject him, even after the time of Jacob's trouble, when they see the New Testament being confirmed with signs and wonders, uh, seeing all the, the, you know, the um, seals, the trumpets, the vials coming to pass, and yet they still reject Jesus Christ, um, that's, they're the ones that are not having the Lord rule over them. That's what you're reading about in Luke chapter 19, verse 27. Those are mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So um, they're going to be slain in the sense that they're cast down into hell. So that's how I would answer that one. Uh, Jeremy Chigger Miller um, says here, one more question. Well, you're only supposed to ask one, if you remember the rules. One more question. John the baptized, Baptist baptized Jesus. The Bible refers to John as a Baptist. No, it doesn't says the Baptist. Uh, some say it means baptizer. God wrote Baptist for a reason and not baptizer. If we do attend a church, don't you think it should be a KJV Bible-believing Baptist church? Okay, you just uh, changed the text there, friend. It does not say John was a Baptist. It says John the Baptist. Now you show me where John was doing the kind of things that independent fundamental Baptists do. Show me where John was meeting in a church building. Show me where John was wearing a suit and tie, clean-shaven, the whole deal like the modern-day Baptists do. 
John was not a Baptist in the sense of the modern day word. Where was John preaching uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Where was John the Baptist preaching 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? Oh, that's right, he died before Jesus Christ died on the cross. John was executed in prison. He was saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the gospel that he preached. He preached the kingdom gospel. All right. Um, to say he's a Baptist is pretty far out. Sorry. Odd interviews. Joshua Alvarez. Answer to your question here, brother. It says, what is the biblical way of dealing with error? I've been a fan of apologetics for a while until I discovered their key verse was being taken out of context i.e. 1 Peter 3.15. We'll go there. Turn there in your King James Bible. It's really about testifying why you hope for Christ in the midst of persecution. For example, Mr. James Whiteout makes a whole bunch of factual lies in his book. Should the biblical response be to deal with each and every error or to simply say, God preserved his word in the King James Bible according to these scriptures, what is the right balance of using evidence and using the promises of God? Very good question, brother. Excellent question. 1 Peter uh, 3, 15. And this is one I have heard, you know, that they'll use. Be, but it says here, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And they say, see, we should be able to answer every man, you know, and... Uh, we should be studied scholars and all this other stuff. You know, it was funny because James White's rebuttal of my video calling him out as a Jesuit, and he's like, you know, these King James only people, they never debate Catholics. And I'm thinking, okay, uh, where in the Bible does it say we're supposed to debate? I mean, Romans chapter 1 says debate is the mark of a reprobate mind. But, uh, you know, I do, I did debate a Roman Catholic, my former neighbor. I told him that he was going to hell. I witnessed to the guy. You know, and uh, let's. But but I should have I should have intellectually cornered my neighbor, and convinced him intellectually that he should have gotten saved. No 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 no. Um, he didn't come and ask me. There, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I'll give you an example of one time that I did do that. I was at Lowe's up in Presque Isle, the city above us, and. Uh, there was a, a one of the workers at Lowe's came out. He was getting the carts and stuff, you know, the metal carts from the thing and taking them back into the store. And I was loading a bunch of wood into the back of my pickup truck I had at the time. And he comes over and he said, hey, can I help you load your wood? And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. You know, thank you. And uh, we're loading the wood and he looks at the back of my truck with all my bumper stickers and everything. And he goes, are you a preacher? And I said, yes, I am. And uh, he said, I said, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian preacher. Yes, you know, I am. And, and uh, he was like, well, my girlfriend's been praying for me and everything, you know, and she wants me to be a Christian and she wants me to come to church with her and everything. And I said, well, I said, I got to tell you, I said, going to church isn't going to make you a Christian. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And got a chance to witness to him. Um, he asked me about the hope that's in me. All right. And I was ready for that. Unfortunately, I didn't have a tract on me at the time. It was one of them deals I'm like, at the store, get the stuff, got to get back, work to do, you know. Didn't get a chance to give him a tract, and I haven't really seen him much since then. I don't think he even works there anymore, but um, the point is I was ready to witness to him. And there have been times I've failed at that. There have been times I have had good chances to witness, and I, I didn't take it to my shame. I'll admit that. Um, but that's what the verse is saying. The verse is not saying that we should debate these Roman Catholics and be able to argue the church fathers and argue this position and that position and all these other things. You know, and I get into some of that scholarly stuff myself. I do study the catechism and some of these other things. But it all has to come back to, are you a sinner? You know, and... You know, if somebody doesn't want to talk about that, then you really have no business trying to argue with them. And uh, because all you're going to try to do at that point is intellectually corner them into some kind of a thing where, oh, I'm, I'm going to become a Christian because I want to be as smart as this guy that cornered me intellectually. It, it isn't right. Um, what we got to remember is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. What we look like you know, to the world, we look like fools. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. It's not honorable and respected and, oh, I, we're so honored to have the honorable so-and-so here and whatever else. Um, you know, that's it's not the way it's supposed to be. I'll say some more on that in a minute. But uh, if you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Natural man is a reference to somebody who's in their sins. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So trying to explain, explain the spiritual truths of the Bible to somebody who's lost and dead in their sins, you can't do it. It doesn't work. So all our responsibility as Christians, you know, if you want to break it down to the, the most basic form, it is to, you know, God's given us the ministry of reconciliation, not the ministry of apologetics, you know, of of going and answering every little detail and breaking down every little fine thing and stuff like this. That's not our job with the lost world. And the first Peter three fifteen is talking about the lost world. It's not talking about, you know, debating among brethren or something like this. Um, and my standard on the thing of James White is uh, if any man comes and says, I'm a Christian and yet hates this book and it knows the issues and stuff, I mean I'm not going to condemn somebody just because they use a new version. They might be deceived. Um, but God's Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth. See, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. You'll get here eventually if you're saved. But when you get somebody that can read the King James Bible and point out errors in it and hate it, and they can read Gail Ruplinger, they can read Peter Ruckman, they can read Sam Gipp, they can read anybody that defends the King James Bible and just pick apart, pick at their arguments and just their whole purpose is to destroy someone's faith in the word of God they're not saved. They're not a saved person. And so to argue every little single nitpicking point that they bring up, you know what they're going to do? They're going to bring up more points, more questions. See? That's what the devil does. That's the purpose of Satan. And you know, when you see you know, Jesus in the wilderness and Satan tempting him, you know, Jesus finally just rebukes it. And he leaves. You know, he warns him. You know, don't forget who you're talking to here, buddy, you know, and Satan takes off. The Lord's not going to sit there for hour after hour after hour debating every little fine point of, you know, it is written, it is written again, it is written again. It is, you know, he, he did that for a little bit, and then finally he said, okay, we're done talking. And he rebukes him, all right? Um, somebody like a James White or somebody like that, I don't even bother with them. Why? Because they don't have a standard of a Christian. So... I can't argue points with somebody like that. You know, I can't... You, I think you know what I'm saying. Uh, what is the right balance of using evidence and using the promises of God? Well, like I said, I think that the right balance is there. Um, you know, there are some things we can discuss as Christians among brethren. Uh, some of the things we've been talking about earlier, you know, uh, when's the mark of the beast going to come in, when this or when that. That's fine. Go over a lot of evidence. Go over a lot of things. But when dealing with lost people, uh, debating with lost people, you have to get them to that point where they understand that they're a sinner. Uh, I don't ever want to get somebody to a point where I intellectually am superior to them and they want to be, you know, and I convince them of their need for salvation intellectually. Uh, the preaching of the cross is always going to be foolishness to them that perish. So our th this whole Christian apologetics thing, I think, is... Um, a very bad thing. Just give you another little story to illustrate my point, and we'll go on to the next question. I actually heard of a, a preacher the one time, he said when he was in seminary, um, one of his professors, Bible college professors, uh, actually said that he had been doing some research, and he was so happy because he proved that a man could actually live for three days and three nights in a whale's belly. And he was so happy about this that he proved that there's actually a part of the whale's interior up near the base of the skull or some kind of thing like this where there's enough oxygen in there that somebody could theoretically live for three days and three nights. So therefore that proves that the Bible is true because the Bible says Jonah was in the, the whale's belly three days and three nights. And so 
now the Bible doesn't look foolish anymore because I can verify it with science. That's not it. Job, or excuse me, Jonah died and was resurrected. You don't have to verify scripture with modern science. Okay? Um, and that's what apologetics is, predominantly. Um, you know, you'll, you'll hear, you know, I saw a little bit of the debate between uh, Anders Snake and James White. It was like dumb and dumber, you know, but uh, uh, two lost men battling it out. But, um, and I use the term man very lightly there. But, uh, you know, and, and James White is like, well, how would you answer a Catholic on such and such? And, and Anders Snake is like, well, I just use the Bible. And, 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 and James White's like, oh, that'll never work. That'll never work. You're, you're going to need more than that. You're going to need more. <laughs> uh, no, you don't need any more than this book. So that'd be my answer for that. Uh, we have Jeremy Chigger Miller. I guess I'll read it here. I said one question, but. Uh, it says, Dear Brother Brian, I've been watching your videos for some time now. I haven't been able to watch all of them, but I am planning to. First, I want to tell you that I applaud your sacrifice you have made to the Lord and your ministry. You're a great godly man, you know, whatever. This country needs more men like yourself. Well, thank you, but, you know, whatever. Uh, my question is about your church messages. Yes, I am a member of Independent Baptist Church. My granddad has been the pastor there for 54 years now. Because of our church and all the ministries our church supports, there has been thousands of people saved. I'll, I'll say more about that. Uh, there is also a Christian school in our building that teaches kids the Bible. <laughs> okay, chapter and verse on that one, please. Where are people supposed to be teaching other people's children? I don't see any scripture for that. It's always the parents that are supposed to be teaching the children. Um... I don't see how our church could be a bad thing if it's doing so much work and glory for the Lord and it gives people a chance to come and gather together and worship Jesus Christ. Matthew 18, 20, it says, Where two or three are gathered in His name, He will be there too. If a church is used to win lost souls and lift up the name of Jesus, how can it be wrong? Uh, well, by that standard, uh, first of all, you didn't give me any scripture there proving a church building. Okay, Matthew 18, verse 20 has nothing to say about some kind of a temple or church that you've built where you invite lost people into it. Okay, the whole debate over church building or no church building is, is there scripture for it? And if there's no scripture for it, then you're doing something outside of the Bible. And when you trace back where do these church buildings come from, they go back to Catholicism. Okay, it's the same argument as contemporary Christian music. We have Christian rock and people are getting quote-unquote saved. Well, let me ask you a question. You say thousands of people have been saved. Our church supports there have been thousands of people saved, okay? Church and all, because of our church and all the ministries our church supports, there has been thousands of people saved. Where are they at? Well, they've made professions of faith, okay? Is there fruit there? Are they continuing? Are they... Are they you know, in fellowship, or they have you seen changed lives? I mean, I've seen this thing. Well, thousands of people getting saved, and then you see them years later, and they're just living totally wickedly in sin. They prayed some kind of false prayer of salvation. All right, it's it's again, are we Bible believing Christians? And if so, then the Bible is our standard. Be very careful about this thing of well. I believe that God is blessing it and using it. I can't prove it from Scripture, but I believe God's blessing it and using it. Then you can make that argument about a whole bunch of other things, too. All right, next we have Buggy R. Cobra Aya. Buggy R. Cobra Aya. Uh, I have two questions. I said, one, apparently people can't hear me too good. How did you discover this theology that you preach in these videos? How's churches moving away from organized religion, etc.? And number two, what education have you received, if any, subject at any time? Okay. Um, I have to read that. Just the, it's funny there, the reply. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lion of Judah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you discover this theology that you preach in these videos? Okay. Um, I didn't discover it. Okay, uh, I came to the Lord as a sinner, and He saved me, and the Holy Spirit of God led me into all truth, and continues to lead me into all truth. Um, but there are saved Bible-believing Christians that have gone that are that are before me, 
and the Lord shows them things, the Lord preaches through them, and I learn from them, and we carry it on. Um, but organized religion, um, there's, you know, most of what people would call organized religion goes back to Roman Catholicism. And you say, well, what if Roman Catholicism is right and you're not? Well, if Roman Catholicism is right, then I should find their teachings in the Bible. And I can just read it just as plain as day for myself, and I don't see the word Pope, I don't see the word Catholic, I don't see sacrament or or nun, or monk, or, you know, uh, St. Peter's Basilica, or, or, you know, the organized religion does things that are contrary to this book. So when I, when I see somebody, uh, some preacher someplace, and he says to me, you know, the Bible says such and such, or, or God wants you to do such and such, I look up in this King James Bible, and I say, is it in there? Oh, actually, yes, it is. This guy told me to look up this verse. Right there it is, you know, uh, just give you an example. Some guy says, you know, um, the foolish people out there in the world, you know, the, the Christians are, look foolish to the world and we're not highly educated or anything else, but God confirms His Word through us. And he says, if you want to see something on that, look up 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, down through verse uh, 31. <clears throat> and so I look it up and it says, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord. Did you see anything in there about that we should build huge big basilicas and have whole cities and reign over, rule over governments and things like that? Did you see anything in there like that? No. So I can look at organized religion with the Vatican and I can say, they don't line up with the teachings of this book. But I can listen to the preacher, the older man of God that came before me and, and I say, he's saying that we're going to be despised, we're going to look, be looked on as foolish. And he told me to read these verses and these verses are lining up with what he told me. So guess who I'm going to believe? Organized religion through Roman Catholicism or the old preacher that tells me what the book says? See, you can look this stuff up on your own. That's why when you come here to this ministry, I'm going to tell you, get a King James Bible and look up these scriptures. Don't believe me. See, that's how the thing works. What education have I received? Uh, well, years and years and years of reading. Again, you know, this education thing. Where's it at in the King James Bible? A Bible-believing Christian will base all of their beliefs upon Scripture. You go through the book of Acts, you go through all the Pauline epistles, and there's not one person that ever builds a seminary, a university, a college, an institute, anything. They're being trained by the Lord. They're being trained by older men of God that are passing down the Scriptures to them. Okay, so as far as education is concerned, if I had gone off to some big seminary, um, I'm being forced into curriculum that may or not, may not even line up with Scripture. And if it doesn't line up with Scripture, and I bring up an objection to that, I'm going to be, you know, they're going to fail me. They're going to expel me from their university because I'm not lining up with their curriculum. You see? So I can go through and I can say, I've learned this, I've studied, you know, and, and by the way, I studied for uh, about 10 years before I entered into making videos and going into ministry and things. So, uh, yes, I do have, you know, what you would call education. Um, have I ever gone to, gone to some seminary or something like that? Well, praise the Lord, no, I have not. Um, I'm very, very glad for that. But, uh, you know, I have talked to PhDs, and I'm saying this, I have to speak foolishly for a minute, but I have talked to PhDs that know less Scripture than I do, uh, that know less about the Bible and Bible-related subjects than I do. Um, meaning what? Meaning that I'm somehow talented or, or super gifted and intellectual genius? No, not at all. They've gone off to some seminary somewhere run by atheists or Jesuits. Well, Jesuits are atheists. They've gone off there and they've had their mind warped, but they have a little piece of paper that says, I've graduated. I have a PhD or something like this. You know, and I've seen PhDs fall right and left. So this whole scam of education, seminary trained, and all this other stuff, and officially ordained, licensed preachers. 
Where's it at? Okay? If you're saved, the Holy Spirit will teach you. Okay, continuing. Christopher. If a man takes a daughter to wife, but does not tell her father whom she is living with, should the husband pay the virgin's dowry according to Deuteronomy 22, verse 29? Or is that for a different dispensation? Does betrothal only come once the dowry is paid to the father or just proposal to the daughter? Uh, I don't really see any New Testament scriptures for dowries and paying things and stuff like that. I don't see that. Um, that would be my simple answer to that without going into a big thing on that. Uh, in the New Testament, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, try to give scripture for each one of these. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, Verse 1, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the, wife, or let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. And it goes down through there, um, talking about the relationship of husband and wife, and then it gets into the thing of, you know, um, you know uh, well, I'll, I'll jump down to verse 6. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Meaning some men can be single, others can't. They want to get married. Verse 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Single, in other words. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Now where did it say anything about dowry in there? It didn't. Okay, so... Again, the rule for understanding the Bible is if there's something in the Old Testament, it will carry into the New Testament unless there's other instructions given. Okay, um, God is still holy. God is still to be revered and respected, um, Old Testament or New Testament. Right? You don't say, well, I don't see the same things there or whatever. No, you still move that in. But like dietary laws and things, clean and unclean meats, that's been an undone. All right, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, I think it is, talks about that. Let me just make sure I got my reference correct here. Yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse uh, 4 and 5, talks about the undoing the prohibition of clean and unclean meats. So anybody can eat anything now as long as you're praying for it. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So that's been undone. Um, I would say 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is the greatest chapter in the Pauline epistles on the subject of marriage, and there's nothing at all about a dowry. Now, if we're supposed to continue doing the dowry thing, uh, it would have been written there. Okay, but I believe that that's been cut off. Not necessary. All right, next we have Arun Pavan. I hope I'm saying your name right, brother there. It says, Hi, Brother Brian. I'm Arun from India. Does God show himself in dreams and visions in the gospel-closed worlds like the Muslim world? Can you do a study on dreams and visions from the Bible and of today? God bless you, brother. Okay, well, I did actually do a study on the thing of what about dreams and near-death experiences. I, it's here on YouTube. Um, just a little thing that people can do. If you go to my main channel... Um, I'll show you here. Try to go to my main channel here. I can show you how to do this because I have the Camtasia thing going here. So you go. Um, right there, to this little, you know, magnifying, excuse me, magnifying glass looking thing, and you just type in something like a keyword like dreams. Okay, and there we have, what about dreams and near-death experiences? Right there. And uh, that was a study I did in 2013, a long time ago. Um, actually, over three years ago now, I did that study. And uh, talking about the thing of dreams and near-death experiences, people seeing visions and things like this. Um, you know, so uh, you have to be careful with the thing of dreams. Um, I would not rely on them as, an, as a real great authority. But I do understand what you're saying about, you know, you have countries that the gospel is not able to get in there and can the Lord use dreams and in places like that. 
Um, well, anybody that would have a dream in a Muslim country and they start spreading it around, I had this dream, I saw Jesus and he was saying this or that, uh, well, does it line up with Scripture? A lot of the dreams I talk about in my study, they're saying, I went to heaven and I saw you know, women with wings and stuff like this, angels, you know, angelic, or, or maybe not even women, I think the one was just angels with wings. And yet you read the entire King James Bible, there's not one angel mentioned with having wings. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about some have entertained angels unawares. You know, so you're not going to entertain some man coming into your home that's an angel and he's got wings, and you go, I, I didn't know he was an angel, you know. Um, so you got to be careful with some of that stuff. I would interpret, if somebody says, I have a dream, or I had a dream, does it line up with Scripture? Um, I think that somebody that would be in a closed gospel country, like Pakistan or some country like that, where the gospels, they're not able to get it in, Iran, Saudi Arabia, you know, some of these other countries, um, could the Lord speak in a dream or a vision? Well, yes. I think that, he, you know, I'm not going to limit God or anything, but God gave us His Word. And uh, I would say that, that somebody in that country that wants to hear the truth, God is going to open up doors there to get them the gospel. Right? Um, dreams and visions are very, very shaky. And I, I tend to stay away from that. Um, Satan can deceive people with the whole thing of dreams and visions. So that would be my answer to that. Um, Next we have Robert Dickerson. What do you believe about once saved, always saved? Uh, well, you want some scripture on that? I do have a whole study on that. Uh, the thing about eternal security. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So if you're sealed until the day of redemption, uh, I would say that's eternally secure. Once you're saved, you're always saved. I'll give you another scripture here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Um, let me stop that for a minute there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. So that's another very strong verse. Um, turn to one other place here. And this is important to get. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Who saves you? So God saves us, okay? Then how can you lose your salvation? All right? Uh, that's important to get. Uh, God is the one who saves you. You don't have to strive to keep yourself saved and die in a state of grace and whatever else, like the Catholics teach. Uh, so I would say, yes, once saved, always saved is a Bible doctrine for Christians right now. Now, in the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming, they have a new thing added there as far as they can't take the mark of the beast. I believe if somebody is professing to be saved at that time and they take the mark of the beast, then they're cut off and they can't get saved after that. Definitely, I would say that. Um, but to, to try and apply that to today, no, no, it doesn't work. So a Christian is saved by Jesus Christ. If you are trying to say that you have to keep yourself saved, then you haven't put your faith completely in the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, and his death, burial, and resurrection. Simple as that. Rai Fra. Brother Ryan. Um, says here, Is it possible that you are able to make tests that require Bible study or course materials on helping learn how to minister, preach, memorize, witness, and or knowing fundamentals, so on? Maybe have a weekly, bi-monthly, or monthly one-page test or something on your website people can fill out with different levels of difficulty different for different levels of Christians, maybe even an exam every six months or, or year, and then just post up an answer sheet every so often. That way people can help themselves without you having to give out long time consuming explanations and be able to have stuff on paper for cut and dry notes. Thanks. <sighs> Great idea. That's a very, very good idea, but uh, 
right now the answer is going to have to be no to that. Um, I just, you know, I feel that our time on line is limited. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the hate crime laws and things like that that are coming, um, they're going to try to shut down, you know, preaching and teaching of the Word of God online. So what I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to get as many sermons out as I can while juggling all the, you know, other responsibilities of being a husband and father and trying to fix things up and working and construction type of stuff. Construction for the ministry. I'm not saying I have a side job in construction. Um, so to, to sit down and dedicate time to coming out with tests and things like that, uh, right now the answer is going to be no to that. Um, in the future, perhaps. It's a good idea. Okay. Brianna Beno. Is it Beno? I think it's Beno. I think I might... I think I'm saying that right. But uh, right here, can you disprove the gap theory some pastors are trying to teach? <laughs> I get myself in trouble on this one. I've really, I've gotten slammed around on this pretty good. Um, some of the brethren uh, seem to put a lot of emphasis on this one. It's, it's a very important fundamental of the faith to some of the brethren. Uh, I don't believe that way. Um, you know, to me, it's I lump the gap theory and uh, geocentricity and the flat earth thing, I kind of lump them all into the same category under the divers and strange doctrines which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Uh, the gap theory, if you don't know, if you're out there, you don't know, they teach that between, between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and 1, verse 2, that there's a big gap in between there. God first created the earth, and Satan and the angels basically were living there. Uh, Satan fell. There was a big flood. God destroyed that first earth, and then he recreated the world after that. And the people that were there on that first earth um, became later became the devils and stuff like this, and demons and things. They're the spirits of the people that died in the first earth, and they'll use different scriptures and things. Um, I've never... You know, uh, let's see what I'm trying to find the one thing here. Okay, my scripture that I would use to debunk it, just to make it very simple. And of course, you know, I know gap theory people will contest this and they go over this and they go over that and all this other stuff. But Exodus chapter 20, verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Uh, God created the world and everything in six days. Not, uh, well, there was the, the kind of like before that, you know, it was like the world was pre-existing before and then he had to recreate it or something. So, no, I don't, I don't uh, fall for the gap theory. Um, the brother I used to be in ministry with, uh, Jesse Dulesky, he has a study on that. It's available here on YouTube, just J.E. S S I E D E L E W S K I Jesse Delesky Gap Theory. You can just type that in, you'll find it. He gets into a lot more of the detail, a lot more of the arguments back and forth about the whole thing. Um, I don't believe in the gap theory, and uh, to me, it's just not worth my time. That's my answer. Dan Daniel Dunbar. Hi Brian, I will be starting to do solo street preaching at the end of the year. I am a newish Christian, around 18 months saved. What are your opinions on street preaching? Do you do it? And do you have any advice for a novice? Okay. Um, I have done street preaching. Uh, because of the way the ministry has gone, I don't do uh, street preaching anymore. I'm not against it. I'm not opposed to it. It's just there's just simply no time at this point in time. Uh, will I do it again in the future? Perhaps. I don't know. Um, but, you know, right now, it's just the video ministry is, um, you know, the Bible says that we're to do, um, let me turn to it. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm getting my quotations right. You know, the, the problem with answering all these questions, it just kind of pulls your brain in a whole bunch of different directions because you're answering a lot of different questions. Um, I want to make sure I get it right, though. Um Titus chapter 3 verse 14 says, Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Um, 
right now the necessary uses and the fruitful work that the Lord has called me to do is video production. There are other brethren that do street preaching. Praise the Lord for that. Um, street preaching, uh, as far as doing solo street preaching, that's fine. But the only issue is going to be there that you might get some people uh, lying about you falsely and things. It's good to have a video camera. I would recommend that. Uh, that you that way you can videotape because that's another witness that they somebody can say hey he's threatening people or whatever and you can say well I got the video right here I'm not threatening anybody that's very important another thing that I would be I would strongly advise against is a little cliche street preaching of you know no such preacher as us or no such creature as a sodomite preacher uh, you know Jesus saves, but Roman slaves, you know, those, those are okay, but Scripture, quote the Scriptures. Uh, I think that it's important to go out, you know, if you have Scripture signs, or if you have signs holding up, make sure it's Scripture on there. Don't have, you know, repent of your sin or something like that. I mean, I believe in repentance of sins, don't get me wrong, but, you know, you should be quoting Scripture, reading Scripture, standing out there with your King James Bible, and, you know, preaching from the King James Bible. Know where to turn to in your King James Bible. And, and, you know, I'm not telling you you have to be some theology expert. You're saying you're a new Christian. Praise the Lord for your desire to go out and preach on the streets. Um, but just go over a lot of the scriptures in Romans. Um, go over those. And if people reject that, well, it's not that you failed because you haven't given them all kinds of great arguments or things like that. Um, but you do need to be careful nowadays because there's so much, so many false prophets out there that are going out and like the Westboro Baptist Church and, and some of these others that are really giving Bible-believing Christians a bad name. And the lost world sees that and they go, yeah, you know, it's street preaching is kind of like, Ugh. they're they're half weirded out by you. But if you're out there and you're, you're proclaiming God's word, uh, you have the witness of, like a video camera or a recording device or something so that people can't lie about you. Um, and of course there's uh, different ways to do this. You can go to a street corner where there's a lot of traffic, people are stopping and things like that, and you can just hold up the Bible and you can read out of the Bible or you can have a sign, a scripture sign there. That's fine. And you can stay there as long as you're on a sidewalk, as long as you're moving back and forth while you're preaching. You're not blocking the sidewalk um, if you go on private property, you can have a problem there. Um, there's there's a bunch of different things that you need to figure out like that. Okay, there's different rules and things. I know that there's uh, different street preaching websites and things. You know, and it's good to know those the rules and the laws and things like that. Uh, some areas you can't use a bullhorn. Other areas, you know, uh, you can. But you know, you can project your voice pretty good if you put your Bible like this beside your mouth you can you can project it pretty good so there's there's different a lot of different tactics to the whole thing of street preaching um, just some things you need to be careful about but the the most important thing is the Bible scripture 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 quoting scripture reading the Bible so let's continue um, next we have W O Q G S Richard, baptism, water, physical or spirit. Talking about Paul and something came up in a study with a friend. Don't know how I missed this before, but I've seen these scriptures and I'll be paraphrasing. These were brought up to me. Paul says, "I came not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. By one Spirit are ye baptized: one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Ye are baptized into Jesus Christ. Christ is risen from into His glory, and no way you can physically." Be a physical element today. Be baptized into Jesus who over 2,000 years ago ascended into heaven, raised into all his glory. This is spiritual. Maybe you can do a study on this issue if you don't have time here sometime. What is your take? Okay, there are different types of baptisms in the Bible, certainly. Um, there's a thing of the ordinance, what I would call an ordinance, and I know that that's not a, it doesn't say baptism is an ordinance in those exact words, but uh, something that you can do after you've put your faith in Jesus Christ to show the death of the old man, that you're buried with Christ and risen again as a new creature. Uh, that's what baptism is. It's going under the water and coming up. All right. 
symbolizing their born again experience. It's not somebody pouring some a cup of water over your head. Uh, that's not scriptural. Nobody ever did that in the King James Bible. Um, but you have that kind of a baptism, which is the physical type of baptism. You have um, the Holy Spirit baptizing you. You're all baptized into one body. Uh, it's a, it's a big study. I, I, there's no way I can get into it here. Um, I have I think I do have a study on baptism, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let me just check here quick. You know, anytime you have a question about uh, any kind of a... Okay, yeah, I did do a study on I kind of remember if I did it was 2014, but what is baptism? You know, right there I have the study. What is baptism? Uh, does baptism save... You know, so anytime you have a question about what about baptism or something like that, just go to my main channel, go to the little search thingy there, type it in, type in some keyword baptism or repent or whatever else, and it'll come up and I've, you know, if I've preached a sermon on it. But there are different types of baptisms. I think there's seven different types of baptism. Um, again, I can't go into all of it here, but uh, that would be the way I would answer your question. Uh, yes, I did do a study on it already. So you can watch that for more information. Okay, next we have Chad Honecker. Question. Um, this is my YouTube name there. Thank you for all your videos. You and your family are very helpful in my daily Bible studies as a non 501c3 Sunday school participant and truck stop missionary. My question to you is this for the FAQs. You have Greek and Hebrew there, or as it is translated to me through the KJV, the Lord of hosts. Why do you think it is not in the New Testament, but used over 200 times in the Old Testament and once in Estrus? Brian and family, thank you for your ministries and countless hours spent on saving lost souls. Well, first of all, I believe that the book of Estrus, if I'm not mistaken, is a apocryphal book. So I would stay away from that, definitely. Um, but as far as the Lord of hosts is concerned, uh, there are many titles of the Lord in the Old Testament that um, change when you hit the New Testament. Uh, I've never actually done a study on the thing of the Lord of Hosts. Um, there's probably a good description or a good reason why that's not in the New Testament. Um, I don't really know. Uh, again, I just take it and I say, well, you know, um, he's called Jehovah in the Old Testament. He's called uh, a, a number of things. And those titles don't carry into the New Testament many times. So. Why? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Um, continuing. Uh, rapture 33, excuse me, Rapture 321 AV. Uh, says here, I've seen this chart on the Trinity in multiple places. Difficult to describe, but it says, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But then it says, the Father is not the Son, the Son is is not the Father. Uh, the Father is not the Holy Ghost and vice versa. You get the point. And I'm sure you've seen the chart somewhere also. But is it true and accurate? I believe in the Trinity, Godhead, but I think the chart makes it more complex. I also read in Appendix 72 of the Ruckman Reference Bible about the heresies of modalistic monarchism, which makes the Father and the Son identical. How do I reconcile these two views with Scripture? Great is the mystery of godliness. You just did reconcile with Scripture. Thanks for your time. Okay. Um, let me see. I, I, I'm trying to think right now. I'm uh, starting to get to that point where I'm starting to forget some of the Scripture references. Um, Isaiah chapter 55. a very important verse. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 it says here, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now when you try to make a chart, I don't, I'm not sure which chart you're talking about there by the way, but um, when you try to make a chart describing the Godhead, some people call it the Trinity, um, it's going to fail. Just as simple as that. You, you're not going to be able to figure out God in a chart. 
uh, it can't happen. It's just I don't care how intellectual you are or whatever else. You know, again, you go back to the just shall live by faith. The faith is the evidence of things not seen. You know, we are we are not supposed to understand God that way. So, um, it is a mystery. You know, figuring out how can God be Jesus Christ and Jesus is the Son, but yet the Father, and how's this and how's that? You know, I wasn't told to understand. I was told to believe. Is the way I would say that. Um, you know, uh, that's why it's so important to develop that personal relationship with the Lord and to live by faith. Um, and you just trust the Lord and things like that. Again, you know, I saw a, um, a brother James Patel, James and Patrick from Ex Catholics for Christ channel on YouTube, and they were out, and this this uh, Muslim man was was arguing with them about, you know, how is it if Jesus is God, then why did he pray to God in the garden and things like this? Well, see, a lost man is trying to understand God, and you can't do that. It's a spiritual thing, um, and to say I have to be able to understand everything spiritual about the Godhead before I can get saved, uh, that's foolish. Um, Jesus died for sinners. Do you understand that you're a sinner? Yes. Well, then, okay, you can get saved. And you say, well, then we can understand after we're saved? No, because God is still higher than our ways. He's higher than our thoughts. We can't write him down on a chart. So uh, how do you reconcile all this stuff? Well, honestly, you just have to believe by faith. Next, we have Alfredo Ramos. Before I ask, please read 1 Peter 3.15. Okay, we talked about that earlier. Um, can a Christian trust the doctrines taught by a possessed Pharisee? Philippians 3.5 and Matthew 23.15. It's clearly a matter of salvation. In 2 Corinthians 12.7, Paul stated that he was given a thorn in the flesh, the angel, messenger, Greek, angelus, Satan, to buffet him. Okay, you're going to Greek. You're starting to worry me before we even get into this thing. Uh, Paul also stated that it would not depart from him. That explains why Paul wrote, No man speaking by the Spirit of God calls the Christ accursed. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say that. 1 Corinthians 12.3 Since he did write that Christ was being made a curse for us. So what, Paul, what spirit did Paul have in the flesh? In his flesh? Job 1.11 That would also explain why that maiden possessed by the spirit of divination uh, was promoting Paul's false path to salvation. No, she was not. No, she was not. She didn't say anything about how to get saved. She said that this man has the Spirit of God upon him. She did not say how to get saved. You're a liar. I believe that Paul, his mystery gospel, and his followers are the terrors mentioned in Matthew 13 and who started the Roman Catholic Church and her daughters. Please remember that you said, please ask any question. Oh, absolutely. You can ask any question, no matter how demonic and stupid it is. Okay? Um, and, you know, hey, you attack what the Bible says, I'm going to attack you back, you know, be a man about it and whatever. Um, to say that Paul is who started the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholics don't even teach that. They say Peter was the one who started the Roman Catholic Church. And look at the teachings of the Apostle Paul. Do they line up with what Catholicism teaches? Do the Catholics quote Paul as their authority for Scripture, or for their church, excuse me? No. They will quote Matthew chapter 16 where it talks about thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. They'll quote other places where uh, the other place where Jesus said about, you know, eating my flesh and drinking my blood, you know. They'll, they'll quote those passages. You will not see Roman Catholics quoting the Apostle Paul very much. So we're getting this idea that Paul founded, his teachings founded the Catholic Church. Uh, you're a liar. Or very, very much deceived, which you're still lying, it's just through ignorance. But um, what you're doing there by going to Greek and things like this, you're assuming that Strong, the Strong's Concordance, that he had the right Greek text, which he did not. He used what's called the uh, majority text, not the Textus Receptus. Uh, that's a big study on that. Also, his definitions. Where did Strong get his definitions for these Greek and Hebrew words? You're just assuming that there's one thing called the original manuscripts, and it's Greek, and there's just one interpretation of that thing, and, and you can use it to judge the English text. Not only that, it's clearly a matter of salvation. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul stated that he was given a thorn in the flesh, the angel. He did not say angel. You're a liar. You're a liar. 
That is not what Paul said. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, so what you're saying then here, um, Alfredo, apparently what you're saying is that if Paul was a false prophet, then all the people who've had their lives changed, all the hymns and everything that have been inspired, you know, down through the years and, and the amazing fruit that's been born by the Pauline epistles, it was all false. It was all demonic. You know, this, this Paul is a false gospel thing is straight from Satan. All right? It's ridiculous. I have a whole study disproving that thing. But 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians, I saw that wrong. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. It does not say angel. You say the angel. Uh, sorry. No. And you see, if you were actually saved, you would understand that the devil will tempt you through things, physical problems and things like that, which is what's going on there. It's not some angel. Paul is saying the messenger of Satan to buffet me, meaning it's something in his flesh, a thorn in his flesh, an infirmity in the flesh that's just continually there to, to just... Oh, just bring him down and stuff. It could have been his you know, bad eyesight or some other thing like that. But you need to keep reading. Again, this proves to me that you're a heretic. Verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. How did you miss that? Hmm? Oh, this is an angel. This, this is a satanic messenger there to buffet Paul, and he, he, it wouldn't depart from him. Okay? That explains why Paul wrote, No man speaking by the Spirit of God. Whoa, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. Paul is saying, this thing is there. The devil's attacking me through this pain in my flesh, this, this thorn in my flesh, whatever the infirmity was there. And he besought the Lord and said, Lord, could you please take this thing away from me? Yeah, I struggled for years and years and years with headaches. And I don't have headaches very often anymore, but now I have other issues with my flesh. It's there. And you know what it does to me as a Christian? It keeps me praying to the Lord. I don't ever get to a point where I just get complacent and just say, ah, everything's just taken care of and whatever. You're going to struggle as a Christian. If you were saved, you'd understand that. You struggle as a Christian. Why? Because Satan is allowed to attack you like that. But through Satan attacking you, it keeps you in a praying relationship with the Lord and his strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul was not saying, I'm led by some demonic angel or something like this and that's why I preach a false gospel. That's idiocy. right? You need to get saved. From the Pauline epistles. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 is our gospel. You better get a hold of that. But thank you for your comment. I'm smiling. All right, next we got uh, Dan and Charity K. Who's the joker not wearing the wedding garment? Matthew 22, verse 11 through 13. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Uh, I don't know why it's not showing me the rest of that verse. It's kind of weird. But it goes on there in verse 13. We won't read all the scriptures. I could turn to it. But if, uh, well, actually, let's turn to it because it's going to be important. Excuse me. Matthew chapter 22. And he is a joker, too, by the way. It's a good way to describe him. We're going to see who the joker is. Um, Matthew chapter 22. Verse uh, 13, Then said to the king, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, I teach, I believe, that the marriage, the wedding happens up in heaven. In Revelation chapter 19, we get on horseback and return with the Lord at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Go out, gather the nations to judgment, and then at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, when the sheep have gone into the kingdom, then the marriage supper of the Lamb happens. 
it's kind of interesting because that's why a lot of times you have the wedding here on earth. You know, people get married, they have a wedding, and then they have a reception afterwards. And many times they'll travel some other place to have the reception. Interesting. Well, we're going to get married in heaven, come down to the earth, judgment of the nations. We'll go out, gather all the people, bring them to Jerusalem for the judgment. Then we go into the kingdom along with the sheep that have been there, or that are there, that have made it through the time of Jacob's trouble. And they're judged by the Lord and they're found innocent. They go into the kingdom. Marriage supper of the Lamb happens. But where does it say there in that time, the judgment of the nations and things, where does it say that Satan was caught at that time? Satan's in hiding. I mean, if the rich men and, and everything, they're, they're, I mean, he gets cast out, Satan gets cast out of heaven in Revelation 12, comes down to the earth. And then by the time you get to the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, um, the rich men and things and all the powerful men are down in the underground, you know, in the dens and the rocks and the caves and things, you know, saying, hide us from the wrath, you know, of the Lamb, essentially. So where's Satan at? I mean, if the rich men have enough sense to go underground to avoid Jesus Christ's judgment, don't you think Satan's probably got some good ideas where to hide? But uh, he kind of sneaks in. I believe it's the, the joker, as you called him, is the devil. Um, Revelation chapter 19, you have the battle of Armageddon there towards the, the end part of it. And the Lord slays the remnant of them with verse 21, gets rid of the beast and the false prophet in verse 20. Then in 21, he destroys the rest of the army. Chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. He's bound and cast into a pit. What did we read in, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 13? Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I believe it's the same event that's going on there. This joker, who's not wearing a wedding garment, of course the devil's not going to be given a wedding garment. Um, he's there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He sneaks in. You know, he's been cast down to, from heaven halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble. He goes through to the end, hides as we're going out and bringing everybody to judgment. And then he kind of sneaks back in and he's spotted at the, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Doesn't have the wedding garment on. The Lord says, get him. Binds him. And as a nice gift for his bride, he goes, look at this, and casts the devil down into the bottomless pit for the thousand years. That's how I'd answer that. Next we have Matthew Allen. Brother Brian, what does it mean in Colossians 1.15 where it says that Jesus is the firstborn of every creature? I know that Jesus is obviously God, and I often use 1 Corinthians 1.15-19 to defend the deity of Christ, but I'm not sure what to make of this phrase. Okay, let's go there. Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15. Yeah. Colossians 1.15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. Um, okay, verse 16 there. By him were all things created. Okay, so who was, who was there in the very beginning? He creates all things. And all things, I believe, are a reflection of his character, of who he is. So when it says he's the firstborn of every uh, creature... I think what he's saying, I think what the text is implying there is that the Lord is saying you can see an aspect of God in all of his creation. He's the firstborn of every creature. In other words, he's there at the beginning. He's the creator. Okay, it doesn't mean that, he, that God was born at some point in time and he had parents or something like that. No, the, the way that it's written there is he's at the beginning. Okay, so... He is the one who's creating. And everything has um, some kind of a characteristic that ties itself back to the Lord. Of course, man is made in God's image. So, uh, let us make man in our image. 
after our likeness. So I think that that's, you know, God puts his own unique character into everything that he creates. So that's why it says that he's the firstborn of every creature. Because he was the one that was there that created him. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, uh, Graham Knight says, Pastor Denlinger, what about Christian colleges and universities? Again, I have a whole study on that. Are Bible universities uh, scriptural? And they're not. Um, there's absolutely nothing there. Uh, I do, there are, I think, a couple references to the word college in the King James Bible, but it is not referring to saved people meeting together and the whole seminary thing and whatever else. Um, I'll show you what you do according to Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2, um, verse 1 says here, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, many men teaching you, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. All right, so the proper way that this thing is supposed to happen, Christians are, Christian men are supposed to teach the younger men. Uh, it doesn't mean you come to some kind of a seminary, Bible college, university type of a thing. You take a specific course and whatever else. Because again, you can go off to a university or a seminary and come out totally deceived, like most do. And, uh, you know, I've never met one man who's been through Bible college that has been able to stand by everything he was taught at his Bible college. Every single one of them... PhDs or THDs or you know just regular earned degrees or whatever else every single man I've ever known that's saved that's been through seminary or whatever else has had to renounce a lot of what he was taught okay so you're supposed to have many witnesses the things that you've heard among many witnesses there um, so I think again just like church buildings uh, I think that universities do more harm than good and church buildings are, do a whole lot more harm than good. Uh, so I would say Christians need to abandon the whole seminary, university, college thing. And of course, you know, uh, you said about Christian colleges and universities. Um, you know, I would say definitely Christian colleges and universities are unscriptural, unnecessary. But uh, especially university of any kind, um, it's a scam. It's a major, major scam. They're going bankrupt. They put you into debt. Uh, again, you know, even Christian colleges and universities will put people into debt, um, causing conflict with what the Bible teaches. I believe that we're not to owe any man anything, according to Romans chapter 13. So I would stay away from them. Gabriel. Hi, Brian. Hi. Thanks for this opportunity. Else than being non-Jews, is there a difference between Gentiles, heathen, and pagans? Okay, I think I know what you're saying. Um, you know, are there, in other words, uh, if you have a, you know, is a Gentile just white men or something like that? You know, or is there, are there differences? Well, um, Paul is dealing with heathen people. Um, see if I can find it here. Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogues with the Jew, or synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others, other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know thereof, or therefore, what these things mean." For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Um, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. And he goes down through there, saying that they're ignorantly worshiping, the next verse, this unknown God. And, um, 
you know, and he says, I'm going to declare who this, who God is and, and, you know, why should we worship him? Verse 30 says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Uh, you know, I would say that in, in God's sight, those people that were non-Jewish were just heathen. Okay? Um, I mean, you have the, the heathen people, another part of the book of Acts, that while Paul is being taken to Rome and things, they, you know... Um, bring, they're helping them get warm and stuff like that, and and things, and and they're they're worshiping false gods and things. So there are heathen, but I don't really see a a difference between like a, a European type people or different types of Orientals that are non-Jews or African, you know, types of people, Hamitic people. I don't really see any kind of differentiation between them. Um, although I will show you one other verse which could kind of lead towards this thing. Uh, let's see if I can find it here quickly. Genesis chapter 10 verse uh, 2 says the sons of Japheth and it goes down through. Jump down to verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands every one after his tongue after their families and their nations. So uh, the Isles of the Gentiles. So the European people are called Gentiles. And, uh, you know, it's it's an interesting study. I don't know if I've ever looked into the thing of does God ever call um, a descendant of Ham, does he ever call one of them a Gentile? Or does, uh, like, a, a Shemitic type of a person, be they Indian or, you know, some people like that, uh, Orientals, does he ever call them Gentiles? Or are they just called heathen or pagan? Um, I don't know. I've never seen anything where they are called, where God separates the white Gentiles versus the heathen African and Orientals. You know, um, you know. I see. Uh, show you another thing here um, on this subject. I'm just trying to think of verses on this issue. Uh, Bible's an amazing book. It really is. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say there is neither Jew nor Greek, pagan, heathen, Gentile. It's Jew or Greek. So in that passage, it looks like it's just Jews and then the rest. I mean, why doesn't he mention, if it's just Greek-speaking people, why doesn't he mention all the other people, you know? So, that would be my answer. Um, I would say that they're used interchangeably. Gentile can mean people that are of anything that's non-Jewish. Um, but usually, you know, they can also be called heathen, pagan, whatever. That's my answer. Uh, let's see. Eagle. Elisha Matthews. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, who are the people of the nations that the saints rule over during the millennium? Goats, chaff are in hell. Sheep, wheat are in heaven or on earth. So who are these people on earth that are being ruled by saints and Jesus? Well, the sheep and the people there in Matthew 25 that go into the kingdom. Um, I believe that the saints are going to be given millennial rule. We're basically going to be Jesus Jesus is going to be in Jerusalem dictating the laws and things like that. And we're going to have the mind of Christ at that point. We'll be in our incorruptible eternal bodies. And we're going to be out over the earth ruling and reigning with Christ um, if we suffer. If you saw the earlier one there I did. Uh, we're going to be out there ruling. And we're going to be rebuilding the nations after they're basically wiped out you know, during the time of Jacob's trouble. So we'll be out there ruling and reigning with Christ. The people that make it through the millennial kingdom will go into that time period. Or the people that make it through the time of Jacob's trouble, excuse me, they'll be there in that millennial kingdom and we're going to be helping them to rebuild their country, ruling over them, you know, kings and priests. The Bible says that we will be kings and priests. We'll be ruling over them um, and 
they will, of course, be having children. So there will be people in that time period that, you know, are going to be born in the Millennial Kingdom that are not going to remember the time of Jacob's trouble or whatever else. But the older people that go through the time of Jacob's trouble and then go into the Millennial Kingdom, um, it's not just all Jews. I believe that there will be people from each different nation and things like that that have made it through that time period. And again, you know, I, I, I can't be super dogmatic because a lot of that stuff is going to be revealed to people in future dispensations. Um, so, yeah, I would just simply, you know, who are the people that are there on the earth? Well, the people that made it through the time of Jacob's trouble.